Okay, you're good to go. All right. Hello, uh, everyone. I'm Hugo Bellin, uh, the immediate past president of the Genetics Society of America. I would like to thank you for joining us today and for, for, for joining us for the next TSA Award Center. Today, we will hear from Harmit Malik, the 2022 recipient of the Edward Novitsky Prize. This award is named in honor of a Drosophila geneticist, Edward Novitsky, and the Novitsky Prize recognizes an extraordinary level of creativity and intellectual ingenuity in solving significant problems in genetics research. A Drosophila research himself, Hermit is widely appreciated for his creative paradigm shifting studies of evolutionary battles that play out within genomes and between genomes. Herman is particularly recognized for his abiding commitment to exploring the causes and consequences of centromere evolution. This work was innovative from its origin in the revolutionary centromere drive model. To test the prediction of the centromere drive model, Armit built a unique research program using what he calls evolution guided functional analysis, which fuses the largely disparate fields of molecular evolution, modern molecular biology, molecular genetics, genomics, and cell biology. While most evolutionary genetics research stops at describing signatures of positive selection, gene duplication and gene loss, <clears throat> Hermit's work takes these remarkable patterns of evolution a step, a step further. For example, Hermit used molecular evolutionary analysis to reconstruct the birth and rapid evolution of the young but essential Embrea gene of Drosophila melanogaster. He paired his evolutionary work with cell biological analysis of Embrea alleles from different species to demonstrate that the adaptive evolution of Embrea allowed it to gain centromere localization in the Drosophila melanogaster lineage. Finally, he used molecular genetics to demonstrate that Embrea is required for proper chromosome segregation in mitosis. Similarly, he applied cell biological tools to the non-model Drosophila virilis testes and embryos to discover a separation of function across duplicates of the centromere identifier genes that encode centromere-specific histones, one of which specializes in sperm-deposited paternal chromosomes. Armin appreciates that there is much to learn from a white phylogenetic lens. He, by applying his interest to silk, moth, dragonflies, fruit flies, mosquitoes, and many others, he has uncovered surprising evidence of essential gene losses in evolution, including CID from holocentric species. These studies combined with his interdisciplinary evolutionary guided functional analysis challenged the broadly held ideas that ancient essential genes are widely retained and that ancient essential functions are supported by ancient strictly conserved genes. For his groundbreaking work, Hermit was presented with the Edward Novitsky Award at the annual Drosophila Research Conference last month. And today we will have the pleasure of hearing him speak about it in more detail. So, just as a final note before we move on, I have two quick housekeeping items that I need to bring up. The first is that all GSA online events are covered by our code of conduct. And you can find the link of that in the chat. The second is to remind you about our questions and answer session with Harmit after his talk. Harmit will talk for about half an hour and you can post your questions on the Zoom and Harmit will read them and respond to you after the end of the talk. So Harmit, welcome, please take it away. Thank you so much, uh, Hugo. It's a real pleasure to be here. I just wanted to also just acknowledge this absolutely gorgeous uh, Ed Novitsky medal that was awarded by the uh, GSA. And I think especially the Drosophila aficionados will recognize this beautiful um, 
chromosomal inversion that was uh, used by Ed Nowitzki during his mapping. Um, so it's a real, uh, to say that it would be a real honor would be actually an incredible understatement, especially because I'm in a field, one of the many fields that Ed Nowitzki started. So I thought today I'll give you a little bit of uh, a mini history lesson culminating in my own uh, work uh, on myotic drive, which was sort of really inspired by a number of uh, observations from a number of people, but actually uh, with Ed Nowitzki very much at the head of this. So uh, many of you are aware of Ed Nowitzki's pioneering work, but I'll basically give um, a sense of the history and his historical contributions to this work as well. Um, my own journey into biology actually was uh, inspired by this concept of selfishness in biology. Um, and many of you probably have heard of the book by Richard Dawkins or read some of the original reviews that inspired this work. And there are many aspects of uh, selfishness that we like to study in the lab in biology, including with post uh, pathogen arms races, but also with mitochondria, with chromosomal aberrations, et cetera. But the, the selfishness that really sort of captures the imagination is the selfishness that occurs between chromosomes uh, during meiosis. And very presciently, Larry Sandler and Ed Nowitzki, two pioneering Drosophila geneticists, uh, as early as 1957 had really pointed out that this kind of conflict in which gametes are not represented in Mendelian proportions is not only uh, not very unusual, but actually as we study more and more, we're gonna discover more and more cases of this kind of um, myotic drive, which is a pretty remarkable statement to make uh, given that it was made in 1957 where, where we were just at the uh, beginning of these kinds of genetic studies and it has turned out to be completely true. Um, indeed, meiosis is rife with competition. And fundamentally, what makes this competition work is that when you start off with a heterozygous individual, you will end up with uh, two gametes, the big A gamete and the little A gamete, which are not genetically identical with each other. In theory, these gametes should compete at two levels. Uh, for example, they could compete at the gametic level where the big A allele could outcompete the little A allele because it makes the sperm that inherited swim faster or it could compete at the allelic level in the diploid organism that happens to inherit one allele versus the other. That's the basis of Darwinian fitness as we know it, where alleles that confer greater fitness will actually increase in proportion in the population. However, with meiotic drive, what tends to happen is that alleles will win in meiosis, even if they actually confer a fitness cost to the organism that inherits it, often in the terms of lower fertility. So this is a case where the unfit allele in terms of organismal fitness can win because it has this unique advantage to take advantage of this uh, bottleneck that occurs, uh, especially uh, when we separate the diploid genome into haploid genomes. Um, I'm particularly gonna focus on female meiosis here, but before I, I do that, I do want to spend some time on the remarkable competition that occurs um, after male meiosis is complete where the products of meiosis are four haploid products that are not genetic twins of each other. And now this process occurs in fungi and plants and animals. And in each of these cases, they all should have an equal opportunity to become sperm or pollen or spores. But if the red chromosome happens to encode a toxin allele that uh, basically prevents the maturation of the purple chromosome containing gametes, these gametes will not be uh, making it to the next generation. As a result, even though this male tends to be heterozygous, it is only going to transmit red chromosomes to the next generation, giving the red chromosome and the toxin allele associated with the red chromosome an enormous evolutionary advantage. Of course, the purple chromosome is suffering a gross disadvantage because it's uh, a male success has basically dropped to 0%. But I hope you can appreciate that the rest of the chromosomes in the genome have also suffered a consequence because they have dropped 50% of their male fertility because of the selfish action of the red chromosome. So this is one of the situations where the toxin allele and everything linked to the toxin allele is winning and pretty much everybody is losing. As a result, we anticipate that suppressors of this toxin will arise frequently to prevent the selfish action of this particular allele. Um, this is technically cheating after chromosome segregation, even though this is also referred to as meiotic drive, we could also refer to as post-meiotic dysfunction. Um, many years ago, when Sarah Zanders was a postdoc in the lab, she discovered this remarkable example of a meiotic drive, series of meiotic drive genes 
in the uh, Fijianese Schizosaccharomyces pombi, um, although the original discovery was actually made in the related uh, species Schizosaccharomyces kombucha, which is the fungal constituent of the kombucha tea that many people seem to favor, especially in the Pacific Northwest. What she pointed out was that the gene family, including the WTF4 um, uh, gene in this gene family, if you were to take uh, diploid organisms and basically make them go through meiosis, there's no drop in spore viability and no evidence for meiotic drive. However, if we deleted just one copy and kept the rest of the chromosomes isogenic, we basically had 50% of the spore viability now. And indeed, the only spores that survived were the ones that actually encoded the intact WTF4 gene. This does not eliminate the possibility that WTF4 is a spore essential gene. So we basically destined these uh, chromosomes that in, the spores that inherit the loss of WTF4 uh, basically might completely fail to function and develop. However, if we delete both copies of the WTF4, we could rule out this possibility because once again, we restore complete spore viability and completely eliminate meiotic drive. So this is an example of the selfish gene in meiosis where the WTF4 really has no consequence um, except a deleterious consequence uh, to the organism because it's, it's dropped 50% of its fertility and it only exists in Fijianese populations because of its ability to actually expand um, and outcompete all the chromosomes that don't inherit it. Uh, Sarah went on to show that WTF genes in general encode two products, an antidote protein and a toxin protein uh, because of different trans transcription initiation sites. And because these are slightly genetically distinct from each other, she could separate them by making mutations in the uh, start codon associated with either the antidote or the poison proteins. And she could also link these to demonstrate genetically that these are indeed the toxin and the antidote proteins, but cytologically linking them provides the most uh, obvious sort of explanation of how this gene family works, where early in meiosis, we can actually see no evidence for the antidote being produced, but the toxin is produced and actually spreads through the entire ascus Whereas late in meiosis, uh, after the spore wall is formed, the antidote gene starts uh, producing itself. So the uh, consequence of this action is that you poison everybody early in meiosis and then protect yourself late in meiosis, essentially ensuring that you're the only uh, genetic uh, component that will get transmitted to the next generation. Remarkably, there are nearly a dozen such examples of poison everyone, protect yourself uh, discovered with completely different biochemical mechanisms and fungi. And the more the opportunity provided for these kinds of um, uh, opportunities for cheating in meiosis, the more uh, we seem to uncover selfish genetic elements that are exploiting them. There are also a famous segregation distorter system in uh, Drosophila, which actually uh, hijacks a nuclear import to cross chromosomal condensation defects, again, to manifest selfish action but also the T haplotype locus, which actually manifests by making a sperm a flagella dysfunctional and therefore prevent making sperm that are not capable of being capable of fertilization and therefore causing its selfish action. I would predict that there are probably many, many more examples of these uh, genes to be waiting to be discovered. I'm gonna spend the rest of my talk talking about female meiosis and also a little bit of the history about how we went about the discovery process for centromere drive. In female meiosis, much like in male meiosis, you end up with four products um, of meiosis. But unlike in male meiosis, where all four products have an equal likelihood of becoming sperm or pollen, in plants and animals, only one of these products is going to be selected to be passed on to the next generation as the oocyte nucleus. So this is a sort of an enormous bottleneck and therefore an enormous opportunity for cheaters to arise. And this was actually recognized very, very early on in genetics. The two prime examples were the recognition of the maze knob elements that were discovered by Marcus Rhodes and later shown to be driving elements that uh, drive during meiosis two by Kelly Daw and Zach Candy. And more recently it's been shown quite beautifully by Kelly Daw and his colleagues that these uh, knob elements, which are satellite DNA that are distal from the centromere, actually hijack this cytoskeletal motor protein, therefore allowing the knob containing chromosomal elements to always orient towards the edges um, of this tetrad of meiotic products. Only one of these edges is actually going to get selected to be the megaspore and therefore transmitted to the next generation. So the knob elements basically are cheating at a critical stage in meiosis 
trying to ensure that they are much more likely to be passed on to the next generation. And once again, they're successful at being able to do so because of the uh, genetic sort of uh, underpinnings of having this architecture of uh, knob elements. And there are a variety of knob elements that exist on a number of different chromosomes. And the kinder genes are one of the uh, prime examples of basically hijacking the cytoskeletal apparatus in order to mediate this cheating. In other work, the ohm locus in mice was also shown to drive during meiosis too, although its mechanism has not been uh, as well worked out at the molecular level yet. Uh, this is not just limited to meiosis too, because a very early report uh, with B chromosomes, which are supernumerary chromosomes and grasshoppers, had shown that actually B chromosomes take advantage of the asymmetry provided by the spindle apparatus during oogenesis to basically ensure that they're actually transmitting themselves to the next generation and even duplicates of the B chromosomes are preferentially transmitted, therefore increasing in copy number. You can see in this diagram in this absolutely gorgeous paper that the polar body is actually uh, makes up actually only a small fraction of the whole uh, plasm in the, in the yeast, but the B chromosomes tend to be very much on the side that is likely to be on the eggward side where it'll actually be propagated and transmitted to the next generation. Another really startling example of myotic drive uh, in meiosis one came from the fate of Robertsonian chromosomes, uh, both in um, chickens and in humans, where the chromosomes, which tend to have their uh, centromeres at the edges, what we refer to as acrocentric chromosomes, can fuse to give rise to a metacentric Robertsonian chromosome. And in female meiosis, the, the fusion chromosome has an enormous advantage in terms of cheating uh, to the next generation in terms of its non-Mendelian inheritance, whereas there is no advantage or disadvantage in male meiosis. So I just want to point out in all of these cases, it's not that we have an all or nothing effect um, uh, in terms of like this transmission distortion. This is a very subtle subversion of the Mendelian expectation of 50-50 transmission, but nonetheless, because it occurs in every meiotic generation, very quickly these selfish elements are expected to rise to high frequency. Um, my own sort of journey into this actually began with this uh, really uh, amazing paper published by Zwick and Langley, um, in which they basically discussed the possibility of a chromokinesin protein, which is again, a protein that helps with the orientation of chromosomes uh, during chromosome segregation. But there were uh, polymorphisms associated with these chromosomes, which we could not really reconcile with traditional models of, of population genetics. And they recognized that they had to invoke some sort of selfish drive model and, and first sort of formulated what they referred to as the OTIT competition model to explain what might be going on where the reason these chromosomal uh, uh, proteins have undergone these polymorphisms that are held at high frequency is because they might actually have a selfish advantage in terms of orienting the chromosomes to ensure their own transmission um, in female myosis. This is still uh, not again molecularly demonstrated, but this was really the most likely alternative to explain the population genetic signatures that they had found. I am doubly fond of this paper, not only because it actually first planted the idea in my head of the OTIT competition model, but I happened to read this paper on the way to flying for my postdoctoral interview with the Hanikoff lab. And perhaps the only reason I actually got the, inter the, the postdoctoral position with, with Steve Hanikoff was because I had actually read this paper and I was able to actually put some of the findings from his lab on centromeric proteins in the context of the OTIT competition model. While we were doing our own work, which I'll tell you about in a bit, um, there was actually also this remarkable discovery in monkey flowers that was actually performed by Leela Fishman and John Willis, and more recently has been done by uh, Finlay Finset, in which in crosses between mimulus uh, monkey flowers, including a selfish, selfing versus an outcrossing monkey flower species, it turned out that when we crossed each of the parental species, uh, in back cross experiments to males, we did not observe any bias, we meaning the field, but this was of course all work done by Leela Fishman and John Willis. But if the F1 females were back crossed to the parental species, there was this remarkable bias observed with almost 100% frequency um, was observed for some markers and almost no bias for other markers. And when Leela uh, arrayed these out on the chromosome, she recognized that actually the centromere proximal markers were basically being inherited on nearly 100% of the time. She went on to show that this kind of drive, which is extremely obvious in interspecies crosses, also occurs in intraspecies crosses, although not nearly to the same penetrance. Uh, so there was a lot of action going on at the chromosomal locus at the same time. 
And so our sort of discovery process began with the discovery that centromeric proteins, including essential centromeric histones, are actually evolving under positive selection. Now, typically we associate rapid evolution or positive selection with genes involved in arms races like immunity proteins, but the discovery that a fundamental component of the chromosomal segregation apparatus was evolving under positive selection, had these sort of uh, insights that were basically building on findings from all of the labs that I just pointed out to you. Uh, centromeric proteins are very, very special in, in contrast to uh, most of the eukaryotic chromatin, which is packaged in core histones, including H2A, H2B, H3, and H4. Uh, the centromeric regions are actually packaged by this variant chromatin in which the histone H3 variant, CENPA, or centromeric H3 variant, replaces the core histone H3 variant and therefore confers this epigenetic mark that's a ubiquitous feature of nearly all eukaryotes um, uh, across uh, biology. There are some very uh, remarkable examples, including one discovered by Ines Drinnenberg in the lab. But for the most part, if you were to actually want to identify the centromeric region in any eukaryote, you'd actually focus on the centromeric histone. The other sort of important contrast is that whereas core histones are among the slowest evolving proteins in the genome, centromeric H3 variants are actually among the most rapidly evolving in across many, many organisms, including Arabidopsis and maize, uh, including in Drosophila, as well as in primates. So to reconcile uh, both of these observations, we, uh, we basically hypothesize that there must be a conflict that is occurring um, during female meiosis for this preferred orientation to ensure the propagation to the next generation. And we, we basically hypothesize that this conflict must be taking place just like the B chromosomes of grasshoppers during meiosis one that allows, for example, the purple chromosome to recruit more microtubules uh, to itself and therefore orient itself uh, to the preferred position ending up basically in the next generation at a higher than 50% uh, probability. Why would this happen? Why would you basically allow such a fundamental component of the chromosomal segregation apparatus to be subverted by this kind of selfish mechanism? Well, one of the reasons, of course, I should also point out that this is cheating during chromosome segregation. So we are, of course, very excited because this could simultaneously explain the very rapid evolution we observed in centromeric proteins, but also the very rapid evolution that people had already observed in the underlying centromeric DNA. One of the reasons we think that this is actually occurring is because in both plants and animals, the definition of what becomes the centromeric region, which means the microtubule attracting region uh, versus the surrounded silent heterochromatin uh, is really not determined by sequence identity at the DNA elements, but instead is actually largely determined by mass action of where the heterochromatin proteins versus the centromeric proteins sit down. Such that if you were to overexpress the heterochromatin proteins, we can encroach into what was previously centromeric domains. And if we overexpress the centromeric proteins, we can actually do the opposite and encroach into heterochromatin domains. And Patrick Hoyne and others have shown quite beautifully, we can even set up shop in euchromatin, which of course would have disastrous consequences for chromosome segregation. So based on this and the kind of observation of epigenetic inheritance, we I argued that any kind of change at the DNA level, either because of recombinational expansion of the centromeric DNA or because of mutations that allowed it to over recruit centromeric proteins compared to the rest of the competition, which means all the other chromosomes uh, in the population, this would now give this particular chromosome an instantaneous advantage in terms of orientation and, and uh, preferred meiotic segregation through female meiosis. Because in general, meiotic drive is considered to be a deleterious consequence either during the course of propagation or because it basically uh, occurs um, uh, to result in lower fertility and viability even after it's gone to fixation. We, we reason that there must be also adaptation incurred because of this selfish advantage incurred by the centromeric DNA resulting in DNA binding preference changes either in the heterochromatin or in the centromeric proteins that basically restore the status quo. So you might actually come back you know, and compare the first diagram and the third diagram, and you'll see that the centromere heterochromatin boundary has not really shifted very much. And you might be tempted to conclude that this is basically a system of stasis, but instead this is actually a system of very rapid evolution with very rapid evolution occurring first at the DNA level, followed by very rapid evolution occurring at the protein level. Very much like a parasitic uh, or a virus that invades the host population by taking advantage 
of binding to a host chromosome to do a host factor to do so. And only when the host factor moves away from this binding affinity can the host actually restore its own fitness. So in this case, of course, it's worth pointing out again that the centromeric DNA and the centromeric proteins are both completely essential components of the chromosome segregation apparatus. And indeed, they're actually collaborators for every process of cell division, except during female meiosis, where because of this asymmetry of consequence or uh, resulting uh, meiotic products, you basically have the situation where these are now turned into competitors. So you've taken former friends and converted them into adversaries just for this particular life history trait. So we proposed this model in a, in a couple of uh, important sort of review papers that uh, I authored with my uh, postdoctoral advisor, Steve Hanikoff, and with another postdoc in the lab, Kami Ahmad, pointing out that actually centromeres were the ideal situation because they were literally at the nexus of where the chromosomal evolution, as well as the amyotic success of these chromosomes would actually occur. So in the time that we've actually proposed this model, there's been actually several amazing components of the model that have been shown to be true by a number of labs, but pri primarily taking advantage of the Robertsonian chromosome by Mike Lamson's lab, which has shown that indeed, expansions of the centromeric satellites can recruit more centromeric proteins, and that recruitment is directly correlated with success in female meiosis. Um, Mike's lab actually also uh, very beautifully demonstrated that in female meiosis, especially in, in mouse oocytes, the chromosomes themselves, because of their sort of proximity to the cortex of the egg, can actually help set up the gradient that leads to the asymmetry of the spindle that is then acted upon by the chromosomes to tell the inside or the successful side from the outside, which is the poleward or unsuccessful side. So the chromosomes in this case are both setting up the gradient that they need to be able to sense inside versus outside and then acting on that gradient to basically ensure that they lead uh, to their own selfish transmission to the next generation. Again, a beautiful demonstration of the cytoskeletal subversion of this process that is mediated by inherent selfishness during meiosis. So in, in some, what we basically argued is that selfish chromosomes start the process of meiotic drive and then lead to suppression by centromeric proteins, including centromeric uh, histone H3, like I, I previously uh, introduced to you. This leads to cycles of uh, new variants arising that can basically, again, reestablish centromeric drive and the new uh, versions of centromeric proteins that are needed to evolve to, again, suppress this myelic drive. This is all very well, but it's actually kind of really hard to study this million dollar kind of uh, forward evolutionary process, uh, even though we call it rapid evolution, I mean that on geological timescales rather than on timescales that thesis committees or grant review committees would actually favor. So to study this process, what we have decided to do is actually to reverse the evolution of the centromeric histone H3 protein, which has gone, undergone rapid evolution in the last few million years, hoping that by restoring it to an ancestral version, we will be able to unleash the deleterious effects of this reversion and reveal what actually drove the rapid evolution in the first place. So in this sort of two-step dance between centromeric DNA and centromeric protein, by making the centromeric protein go backwards in evolution, we are hoping to reveal what the deleterious consequences uh, of this is that actually drove the evolution of this otherwise essential protein in the first place. And this is work that was actually done by, uh, is being done by Ida de la Cruz and also was initiated by Emily Cole, a former technician in the lab. And to do this, what we've basically done is taken advantage of the enormous resources that we have in the Drosophila community because of a number of strains of Drosophila melanogaster, but also nearly 110 species now of Drosophila that have been very nicely sequenced at high depth of coverage, allowing us to basically make versions of the SID allele. SID is the uh, uh, centromeric histone uh, gene in Drosophila, which give rise to this uh, uh, taking the melanogaster allele um, which we recoded to ensure equal transmission. And then we can also introduce the similens allele, again, recoded to ensure it's properly expressed in melanogaster. And then taking advantage of a number of outgroup species, we can also reconstruct the ancestor, which is the melanogaster similens ancestor, and essentially put these back into the endogenous locus, thanks to the awesome power of CRISPR-Cas9 engineering. 
So essentially, we've taken the melanogaster gene and replaced it with the recorded version, which is identical at the amino acid level. We've changed it for the Simlens version, which is different at 21 amino acid positions out of 225. So that's 10% divergence in just 2 million years of divergence. And then the ancestor, which as you'd expect is halfway between melanogaster and Simlens in terms of its divergence. It's worth asking what could go wrong in these kinds of assays. You could imagine mitosis could go wrong or meiosis or centromere identity inheritance, which is the centromeres need to be actually transmitted through both sperm and oocytes correctly. And my money was entirely on male meiosis when we began this experiment. And I've even argued that this has to be male meiosis in a number of reviews, which is almost like setting yourself up for disaster because that's probably the least likely to be true. But nonetheless, we've got these recorded flies. Now we can ask what happens. So in a sort of nearly wild type like situation with the recorded Sid melanogaster females and recorded Sid melanogaster males, where the sperm carries centromeric histone, the maternal uh, pronucleus carries centromeric histones, but the vast majority of centromeric histones are deposited in the oocyte cytoplasm to ensure uh, proper chromosome segregation following fertilization. Luckily for us, we were able to show in the second iteration that we basically recover adults at the expected Mendelian frequency. So our recording and Cas9 Cas engineering did not disrupt anything about SID function. When we cross heterozygous parents though, containing either the ancestor of the Simlens allele on one chromosome and the original melanogaster allele on the other chromosome, we now expect to see three types of progeny, the, uh, uh, the melanogaster homozygote, the parental heterozygote, and now the melanogaster uh, version which, with the wrong SID allele. And indeed, we actually recover all of these, except that the version with the wrong SID allele is actually significantly lower than expected um, compared to Mendelian frequencies. And this is highly temperature sensitive. So if you raise these flies at low temperature or high temperature, their fitness is even lower. So already a sense that there's a viability difference, but we were really excited to get these adults because now we can assess their fertility. And that's what we did by crossing uh, male flies containing the wrong SID allele to, to melanogaster females, hoping that we basically see a gross fertility defect, but we did not see any defect whatsoever. If we take female flies encoding the wrong SID allele and cross them to melanogaster males, we also did not see any fertility defects. So this actually means that my two favorite hypotheses had already gone out of the window because if you're an adult fly that has the wrong SID allele, you're perfectly fertile. Um, and this is, of course, very depressing to come at the end of like a long odyssey of myotic drive and uh, engineering, except we realize that we have not done the critical cross, which is to cross both parents with the wrong SID allele to each other. And when we did that, we basically discovered that there were no adults. Um, and in fact, this is a very highly penetrant phenotype because the melanogaster versions produce hundreds of progeny, as you might expect but the ancestral uh, versions and the Simlens version produced basically no progeny. The few ancestral progenies that we got were not able to sustain for a second generation. So this is our first evidence that in fact, SID is perfectly matched to some component of the melanogaster cell, either other kinetic or proteins or to the genome. And in the absence of that perfect matching, you cannot actually survive through embryogenesis. And all of this is rescued by a sid mel rescue transgene. What is the cellular basis of what's going on? Well, we don't know exactly, but we have very good clues. And that, that takes advantage of the fact that we have beautiful cytology that can look at the synchronous embryonic mitotic divisions that happen during, during early embryonic mitosis in Drosophila. So these, each of these dots represents a single nucleus that are basically going to uh, synchronously uh, go undergo mitosis. And you'll notice that when you have the melanogaster uh, version here, you, these dots basically remain on the periphery. In contrast, when we basically have the ancestor, you can notice that things seem to go okay until a certain point uh, during development where all of these nuclei start dropping towards the center. That's an indication that they've undergone some sort of mitotic defect and are no longer uh, capable of actually undergoing further mitosis. And so this is dropping away from the center in a process called nuclear fallout that was initially described by Bill Sullivan. So as a result, you basically, if you look at these fixed images, you have these beautiful red dots now indicating individual nuclei with a few, only a few red dots in the middle. Whereas if you look at the simulans of the uh, uh, ancestral homozygous embryos, we have these gaping holes in where the red dots should be present, but have been lost because they were mitotic defects causing that dropout to occur. This results in 
beautiful melanogaster embryos if you basically have the proper SID gene, but if you have the wrong SID gene, these embryos are missing mouth parts and have incomplete denticle patterns, which would basically mean that they're not going to survive through a development. They are actually not even able to crawl out perfectly out of their vitellin envelope, as you can see from these sort of messy preps here. So the net result is that after all of this, we've discovered that it is actually early embryonic mitosis, which would have been my least sort of favorite guess, which is where we see the defects. And the defects actually occur because early embryonic mitosis in most animals is very rapid, occurs at very rapid speed and in the absence of any cell checkpoints or heterochromatin proteins to try to suppress uh, centromeric defects that might actually arise because of mismatches between the protein uh, and perhaps the DNA. I also want to point out that there's this beautiful evidence for epigenetic inheritance here, because even though these flies, these crosses are not able to make it, even if we have limiting amounts of the proper SID protein from the melanogaster uh, father, you're able to completely rescue these. So even the diminishingly small amount of SID mel protein is able to rescue these flies. So the net result is we've got this fundamental conflict now that was basically inspired by a culmination of work that goes back to Sandler and Novitsky between components of the essential components of the centromere um, uh, apparatus or the chromosome segregation apparatus. And of course, it didn't escape our attention that if this process occurs rapidly, even in two isolated populations, we could quickly arise to a situation where these protein and DNA components are not going to work perfectly well with each other. And indeed, we have, we and others have actually found that many so-called speciation genes or genes that are important for hybrid incompatibility are either themselves heterochromatin DNA, as Dan Barbash has nicely shown, or heterochromatin binding proteins, as we and many other uh, folks have actually shown. And so whether this is actually related to centromeric defects or because of chromosome chromocenter uh, formation, as Madhav Jagannathan and Yukiko Yamashita have proposed, nonetheless, what it uh, suggests is that the fundamental sort of answer to Darwin's mystery of mysteries or why animal species, interspecies crosses reveal hy uh, hybrid sterility or inviability might at least at some level arise from genetic conflicts that are taking place from this dark matter of the genome, which is where all of the heterochromatin resides. So that's the end of the science part. I just want to acknowledge that even though it, it, this is an individual award, um, there's a lot uh, of people who have actually like uh, really sponsored my success. Um, not least are the amazing trainees. These are the former postdocs, former and current postdocs and graduate students who've contributed. I highlighted some of these postdocs along the way. I didn't have a chance obviously to highlight all of their work. I am also especially grateful that two former trainees actually first nominated me for this extremely prestigious award. And whether you see this as a success of a selfish meme about selfishness in biology or an altruism, we can sort of go either way. I also want to thank my mentors, Steve Hanikoff, who was my postdoctoral mentor, Michael Emmerman, who was my mentor for all of the host virology work we've done, and Sue Biggins, who's uh, my mentor, and she's also my current boss, so I have to be especially nice, because she's really been an inspiration for how to really run a lab that is extremely kind, but is also extremely successful. And last but not least, in addition to my trainees, we've had some really strong positive epistatic modifiers by the senior scientists in my lab, who I owe an enormous debt of gratitude, Daniel Wormack, Ida de la Cruz, and Janet Young. So thank you very much. I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, I see no questions. If anybody is interested and has a question for Ermi, please go to the chat box and we'll wait a couple of seconds to see if you have any. I questions. see that Rodney has his hand raised. Uh, Rodney, do you want to ask a question? Sure. Um, Hugo, you don't mind if I ask it live, do you? No, no, I Great. do not. It's better. Um, Armit, great, great, great talk. Um, I love this stuff. Um, so I wanted to understand how the centromere sequences are basically co-evolving, especially in organisms that have multiple centromeres. So um, all of a sudden there's been a change um, in one of the proteins that's binding there, but there's gotta be so also changes in the centromeric sequences. How do you imagine that's going on? Yeah, so I think, so just maybe if I can rephrase the question, I think what Rodney is asking is, 
the centromeric satellites are actually different. Like in Drosophila, there are four chromosomes and the centromeric satellites are distinct on all four chromosomes. And SID has to bind all four chromosomes to ensure proper chromosome segregation. So if one of these chromosomes starts this battle for mitotic drive and SID adjusts to them, how is it capable of still performing its ancestral functions? And the fact of the matter is that's why it's actually super constrained. And even the positive selection that we see is probably likely to be a very small sort of fraction of the workable alleles that Sid was able to undergo. This is also something that we are currently exploring. We haven't actually gotten the home run experiment yet, but we are also suspecting that one of the reasons why we continue to see um, the manifestation of a negative effect, even after the drive has gone to completion, might be because of apportioning of the Sid protein correctly among the four chromosomes. So we do not expect that we, we will expect to see deleterious consequence of chromosome segregation on all chromosomes. We suspect that once a particular chromosome has driven, it will continue to recruit more centromeric protein, even in mitosis, to the detriment perhaps of the mitotic success of the other chromosomes with different centromeric alleles. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. All right, there is a question from Sarah Zandler. <sighs> This is not, I'm not looking forward to that. When dad has Sid from Melanogaster and mom has the ancestral allele, do you see dad Sid transferring to mom's chromosomes in the zygotes early embryos? Sarah, that's a great question. We are actually trying to do that exact question right now. We have now made sort of uh, alleles that we can image that will look for the uh, perdurance. We do not see that perdure beyond you know, the early 10 cycles, which is when we've imaged. So that transfer must occur much, much earlier. We are in the process. I cannot tell you that we've actually got that home run experiment yet, but we suspect there are only two models. Model number one is what you propose, which is that that Sid is jumping to mom's centromeres, uh, the maternal centromeres and telling um, Sid where to go, or that even sort of hetero uh, dimers between that SID and the simulant SID that's already present is able to go to the right centromeres and then propagate itself beyond that initial cycle. We have not excluded either of those models, but we are working towards that right now. Okay. Uh, Another question from Zhang Zizou. Yes. Uh, Zhang Zizou is asking, is the factor that you identified in yeast as a meiotic driver, species specific for fission yeast only. Actually, Sarah's already jumped off. So this is not something that, this was Sarah's discovery and Sarah's lab has actually made some amazing things. So if, if Sarah will permit me to uh, maybe just uh, present her lab's work, which is that these are actually present only in fission yeast and they're not even present in all fission yeast. So this appears to be a relatively recent thing. now. We cannot exclude the possibility that it was horizontally transferred from something else or rapidly evolved from something else because these genes are rapidly evolving. So tracing their evolutionary origins is probably not trivial, but it certainly appears to be specific to just some species of fission yeast. Sarah, did I screw that up? That was okay? okay. That's right. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, I see David. David Rand has his hands raised. Go ahead, David. Hi, Harmeet, great talk. I was just putting this in the chat. Um, my question, maybe you described it, is about the evolution of the repeats, the centromeric repeats, and this coevolution question I think Rodney just asked. Um, can you find the concerted evolution caught in the act, so to speak? I mean, the, the repeats get homogenized, is that correct? Yes. And the, that's presumably by some concerted evolution pattern you see, but there's a process of unequal crossing over or con gene conversion and so on. And can you find stuff that's halfway done on that, that is allelic variants that are in the process of this DNA sided part of the coevolution, presumably of these proteins and the centromeric repeats? Uh, excellent question. I think the best evidence actually for catching this concerted evolution in the act has not actually come from Drosophila, but has actually come from uh, beautiful studies of the human alpha satellite arrays that were really initiated by Beth Sullivan and Hunt Willard um, many years ago. Uh, in particular, Beth has examples of these chromosome uh, 17 allelic versions, where again, you've got this epigenetic, uh, you know, where there are two satellite blocks and one inherits centromeric uh, proteins in certain cells and the other one inherits in other cells. And then they're kind of faithfully propagated. With the amazing kind of assembly of, uh, you know, telomere to telomere things, I mean, the centromere folks like me, are especially very, very excited because we actually have the entire like arabesque 
going from the surrounding decrepit satellites that are where the heterochromatin is and where transposable elements seem to form, getting closer and closer to where the meat is, where it appears to be completely homogeneous, pristine, concerted evolution right in the middle where the CENPA proteins are actually binding. Cool. So that must be going on rather rapidly on a um, we, we think it's actually going on rapidly enough, but I think it also has to do with how much, uh, you know, what is the sort of selective sieve for slightly deleterious variants to creep in. I suspect we are catching them in the act more successfully in vertebrates for that reason, because the yeah. NE is perhaps not as uh, high as it would be in Drosophila. Cool. Thank you. Great talk. Yeah. I don't see any other questions, Hugo. I don't see any other questions either. Well, let me thank you all again, and let me thank the GSA board for this enormous honor again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Great talk, great research. Certainly fitting with Novitsky's kind of uh, research. So I think it's a, it's a perfect match. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.